Alert! <laughs> Ebola, West Africa, uh, uh, and other phyloviruses. We shall see um, with our clicker questions for today, um, because it's from last time, of course, so we need to keep going. Um, concentration of which of the following measles proteins is most important to determine whether messenger RNA is made or genomic RNA? NCVLG. And I probably should have put them up alphabetically just to make it even more confusing. Pardon? Yeah, well, actually, so NCLDV um, with the other one, that's the uh, nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses. That's the way I should put it up there. But um, G doesn't fit, so. <laughs> Random acronyms are always fun. And even more if you remember. Yes. <laughs> Forty-two, forty-three. Quick count. How many people are here? <laughs> Ten. We should get up to fifty for exams. It's more like seventy. So, <clears throat> what do people think? They seem to be somewhat divided. Um, what does N stand for? Nucleocapsid protein. C. <laughs> um, most importantly for us, what about L? Polymerase. L is the polymerase, and G is the so, or glycoprotein. Whenever you see G, you think glycoprotein um, for these things. So, um, what is going to make that decision? The answer is A. Yes, it's the nucleus, uh, <clears throat> nucleocapsid protein. And so, it's really that binding, and that's what you need the most of. Um, it's the protein which is right at the very three prime end of your genome. That's what ends up getting made many copies of, way more than the next one because that's when you have your start-stop um, process going through. <coughs> it's happening um, here. So uh, that's basically the important aspects about paramyxo and rhabdoviruses. Again, measles and rabies for the most part. Uh, Structures, again, are pretty random, particularly for any of these enveloped viruses. Uh, these are longer, skinnier ones, and the only reason for that is the matrix protein, which is bound to the helical form of your genome, again, packaged in the end protein. Um, our binding and entry, again, we talked about G um, as being the fusion and binding protein. Uh, replication. Here is, again, sort of that start-stop, but the important thing, again, is the concentration of the end protein. Um, translation is pretty straightforward and getting out. Most of these are, are budding at the plasma membranes. Uh, partly why I wanted to talk about this a little bit more is that um, the phyloviruses are basically just really big paramyxo and rhabdo-like viruses in terms of their molecular replication, molecular virology. Of course, they cause... Uh, much nastier diseases, and so uh, that's why everyone gets so excited about it and you know, puts it on the cover of their um, please send us money brochures. So <clears throat> a couple of key concepts here. Uh, again, they're basically really big rhabdoviruses. Um, there are a couple of slightly different things relative to those rhabdoviruses. Um, there's RNA editing that takes place, and actually the RNA editing is very similar to what happens in the paramyxos and the rhabdos where you have stuttering, so the polymerase, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is making your messenger RNAs, will add a couple of extra nucleotides, either in terms of making poly A tails or then changing the open reading frame. So that's what happens with the PCV proteins um, in the <coughs> paramyxos and rhabdos. Of course, um, hemorrhagic fever, and we will talk about that. Don't worry. Um, nasty, ugly pictures. Actually, no bleeding out of all orifices. Um, so 
don't worry about that. Um, the other thing that, in fact, I added, some of you may or may not um, have this in the notes because I didn't upload this. I just changed it this morning. Um, transcriptional regulation is also a difference between these filoviruses and the paramyxo and rhabdoviruses. So just wanted to um, concentrate on some of those things. Uh, here, um, pretty much everybody knows this image, I think, by now. Hopefully, anyway. Let's back up. Um, this is everyone's favorite image of <clears throat> Ebola virus. Um, most people don't know that it was taken by F.A. Murphy um, in a building that I'll actually show you a picture of in about 15 minutes. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about um, these filoviruses. And instead of talking about disease at the beginning, we'll talk about disease at the end because we've got a couple of videos and things that I wanted to um, share with you as far as that's concerned. Um, plus, we could also spend hours talking about disease. And I want to get through the important stuff before we get to the boring stuff. <laughs> um, so again, you know, talk a little bit about the structure. Mostly, again, it's just this you know, big, long uh, rhabdovirus. The genome is extremely similar to what you see in the rhabdo and paramyxoviruses. Um, the proteins are similar with one big difference, and that has to do with the regulation of transcription and how that actually functions in these particular filoviruses. Um, why that makes such a big difference in terms of disease is really not clear um, and is unfortunately, um, hopefully, obvious because of this. You don't want to be studying too much disease states when you end up losing most of the people you're trying to infect and study in the process. Um, so here's the cartoon version. Um, this should, again, look extremely similar based on the stuff that we talked about last time. Um, these are negative strand RNA viruses, so they have to have an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. They have a genome, which is packaged by an N and P because they all want to have different names for things, but uh, this is equivalent to the N protein in the paramyxo and the rhabdoviruses. Um, membrane, so it's an enveloped virus, has a matrix protein and a glycoprotein on the outside. And then the big difference again here is this VP30 protein. Um, VP again, virus protein, 30 for 30 kilodaltons in size. Again, very boring nomenclature for a lot of these things. Um, again, looking at the genome, down the bottom here is our standard paramyxovirus genome. Should look really familiar relative to this genome up here. Again, they're negative strand RNA viruses. The nucleocapsid or nucleocapsid protein is present here at the three prime end. The polymerase protein is present down here at the five prime end. Not surprisingly, you have this start stop mechanism for making the individual RNAs. The major difference between these two genome sequences is that unlike the case with the paramyxo and rhabdos down here, where you actually have a space between the end of one gene and the beginning of the next gene, um, here a couple of them actually overlap with each other. And so here, for instance, is your poly U that gets copied into your poly A tail through stuttering processes. It actually is a little bit downstream of where the start of the next gene happens to be. And that's true um, here in the, the middle of this particular genome. The other thing I wanted to mention, and you know, that's because he's got the exclamation point up here in his slide, is that these are really big um, in terms of the genomes, not just the virion, but the genome as well. Uh, if you, how big are the largest RNA genomes? Yeah, 30,000 odd, which are the, which kind? Coronaviruses. We're all studying for the midterm, right? This stuff is going to be on there. Uh, so these are getting close. You know, 19,000 is really, really big in terms of an RNA virus genome. And so one of the things that means is you're going to get a lot of variability in that genome. Anytime you get a particular isolate, you'll be seeing that there's quite a lot of variability, um, which is generated in a lot of those things. So we'll <clears throat> talk more about that when we talk about some of the disease cases later on, because one of the really important things about following disease and any of these filovirus outbreaks is figuring out where the outbreak came from. 
and doing the, the isolation and case tracing um, as far as that's concerned. So emphasize a couple of these things. One down at the bottom here, um, VP30. This is the one which is important for regulation of viral transcription. Um, curiously, in Ebola, but not in Marburg virus. Um, Ebola is, of course, our friend, uh, but Marburg is just about as nasty um, and a very, very similar in terms of its genome. Uh, why this VP30 is very different between the two is not entirely clear, um, but it does seem to make a big difference. And we we'll talk about right at the end, some of the vaccines, in fact, are taking advantage of this um, for looking at <clears throat> Ebola virus. Uh, GP, glycoprotein, again, G for what's sitting on the outside of the virion, what's going to be interacting with the receptor. Uh, this is <clears throat> also very similar, and hopefully, you can look down here, it corresponds to the G protein of rhabdoviruses. G, you know, well, very, very similar kinds of things which are going on here. So let's look a little bit at this particular G protein or GP protein. Um, just like is true for vast majority of these receptor binding proteins that you find on the outside of virions, it's made as a precursor protein that then gets cleaved with a cellular protease. Um, this is what happens in the flaviviruses. It's what's happening in the paramyxo and rhabdoviruses. We'll see on Friday what's happened with the orthomyxoviruses with flu. You've got proteolysis that takes place, basically priming this protein to be able to have its fusion activity and receptor binding activity. Uh, this particular protease is the furin protease, um, also one of the cellular proteases, which happens uh, very, very frequently to be what you need to have in terms of getting this fusion to take place. Highly glycosylated, um, many, many, many sugar residues on the outside of this particular molecule. Why that's important is not clear, but um, that's one of the things that's seen. Does seem to form very similar, again, to what happens in your paramyxo and rhabdoviruses in the ER and the Golgi, just like all, almost all of these other fusion proteins that we've talked about, um, present as a trimer. Um, in the first version of this lecture, again before last night, I had the receptor question mark um, here at the end. That was last year. We didn't know what the receptor was and was really still kind of controversial. Um, not surprisingly, because there's been considerable amount of interest in these viruses in the recent past, um, people have now really honed in on the receptor. And literally a couple of months ago, this is a publication in Cell where we have the GP protein from the Ebola virus. And now pretty clearly the major receptor on the cell surface, um, this protein called Neiman Pick um, C1 protein. Uh, don't ask me what Neiman Pick C1 is supposed to do. Um, I don't know, and in fact, as far as I know, it's actually kind of controversial. Um, it is a, the reason it's named this Neiman Pick protein is that there's some very rare genetic diseases that then um, people have when they're missing this particular protein. Presumably, those people are resistant to Ebola, but they've also got all kinds of other problems. So um, I wouldn't say that's a necessarily um, really good prospect in terms of taking a look at that. Um, on the other hand, when we get to HIV, we'll talk about um, some of the other processes in terms of receptor binding here. But this is a, um, a really nice paper where they have a uh, now high resolution structure here of the Neiman protein C1 protein together with the <clears throat> lycoprotein from Ebola virus. And what seems to happen here is this interaction now changes the structure of this glycoprotein, allowing the membrane fusion to take place. So this is not a pH-mediated process. Um, it's something which you're getting a fusion that's happening at the plasma membrane. Um, and it turns out neiman pick c one is present in lots of cells, but particularly immune system cells, um, which are there. So we have binding, fusion, that all seems to be pretty normal, as it were. Um, once the genome is released on the inside of the cell, basically just like paramyxo and rhabdoviruses, start stop in terms of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, stuttering that happens whenever you have a stretch of use will give you a nice poly-A tail on any of your messenger RNAs. Genome versus antigenome happens because of the concentration of the NP protein, 
just like you see with the paramyxo and rhabdoviruses. The budding process, just like you see in paramyxo and rhabdoviruses, you know, how many times are you going to say that in this lecture, um, happens at the plasma membrane, the matrix protein, which associates with the plasma membrane where you've got expression of your GP protein that's been stuck in the membrane. Then you have budding that takes place um, at that point. RNA editing happens in a very similar way to what happens in the paramyxo and rhabdoviruses. Here it's <clears throat> slightly different because we have the, uh, in paramyxo and rhabdoviruses, normally it's the long version of the protein which is made in the absence of editing and then gets shortened. Here it's one which is considerably elongated and particularly interesting is that this turns out to be the glycoprotein. So glycoprotein, that's what's interacting with the receptors, is clearly absolutely critical for the function of the Ebola virus, and also true for <clears throat> Marburg, any of the phyloviruses for that matter. Um, these all absolutely require this RNA editing to take place, because if you don't have the regular glycoprotein, which is going to be you know, sticking in the membrane, allowing you to get membrane fusion, interacting with neiman pick c one if you don't make that, then you're never going to be infectious. So this RNA editing, the, the slippage that takes place, um, and you can see that right here. Again, it's just a stretch of A's, which of course would be you know, what's being coded for then a whole bunch of U's here, and you just get slippage that takes place. You end up with <clears throat> an extra A here that changes your open reading frame, that gives you the glycoprotein. So again, editing is absolutely required here for virus function. Um, and the way that people know that is if you change the editing site here slightly, um, where you end up with <clears throat> these, uh, just change again, since you know the genetic code, you can take something that codes for lysine instead of being three A's, just add a G at the end in the wobble position. You end up with <clears throat> the appropriate protein, but no formation of, depending on how you do this, here they've actually added that extra residue, so you end up with the frame shift. In the absence of the frame shift, here this particular version of the protein down here doesn't make this SGP. Now what the heck does S stand for here? It's the secreted glycoprotein. And so one of the other things that you see, and in fact is one of the diagnostics that people use for looking at phylovirus in general disease, and to some extent for Ebola as well, um, is not only do you have the glycoprotein on your envelope, but there's a lot of extra glycoprotein that's floating around. Let me back up here. Sorry about this. A um, couple of slides. You see this extra piece right here? That's basically the extra secreted um, glycoprotein out here on the outside that may be involved in confusing the immune system. Um, one of the things that people are trying to do and why they did this editing process down here in the lab is to try and figure out what the role is of this secreted glycoprotein um, together with the glycoprotein and starting to look at disease. I think the jury is still out on exactly what's going on as far as those are concerned. The other aspect of Ebola virus molecular virology, which is different from paramyxos and rhabdos, is this <clears throat> structure, which you have at the very five prime end of your nucleoprotein messenger RNA, um, poly A tail added down here at the end by, of course, stuttering. This stem loop structure, um, at first I was like, well, how the heck is you know, this causing a problem? You know, it's blocking transcription, but you've already made this messenger RNA. How can that be causing transcription? Is this a typo? Did somebody put in translation instead? But no, it actually is transcriptional regulation, and the transcription regulation here is also, I don't know, I don't like the terminology, but this is what they use in the textbook. Um, it's the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So remember, we're not talking about what you normally think about in terms of transcription. Again, the DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. This is your RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So the formation of this hairpin structure here blocks not only the transcription of really most importantly the downstream genes from here, 
all the other proteins that you need in terms of making a virion, but also the fact that you've got this hairpin structure here. And hairpin just means that these are all complementary base pairs with each other. They're complementary in the messenger RNA, but they're also complementary in the genomic RNA. And so that means that in that genomic RNA, which is released after the fusion process, you also have this hairpin loop. And that hairpin loop is going to block the <clears throat> transcription from taking place, i.e. the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, from coming down and making a whole bunch more of this NP protein. And it turns out that this VP30 protein, the one that I mentioned as being one of the really different ones between rhabdo and paramyxoviruses and these phyloviruses, that's critical for relieving this block. And so if we're going to, I don't want to back up again too much here, but if we think about that virus cartoon, you remember there's a whole bunch of VP30 already associated with the genome. And so if you have all that VP30 associated with the genome, then you can get normal transcription, quote unquote, or activity of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase in order to get all of this <clears throat> transcription of the messenger RNAs. In the absence of VP30, you don't get that. And so it's all shut down. And quite why that is, is again an interesting and open question, but people have used this now to also develop anti-Ebola vaccines. Um, so it's a really useful kind of thing um, to look at. So happy on the molecular? No. Yes. No, not yet. So <laughs> Trevor. The reason why this is effective has to do with the RNA, RNA polymerase. RNA dependent RNA polymerase, correct. And that's Okay, so the, the important thing, I'm sorry, I'm going to paraphrase your question, is sort of, you know, why do we need this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase really for making the proteins, et cetera? Can't we get away with some other process? Is that a better way of, of asking the question? Or? Yeah, so this is, and again, maybe I need to, to back up again here. This is, these are purely RNA viruses. So the only way they're going to make messenger RNA, and this is true for all the other ones we talked about so far, is you have to have a viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And that viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerase has to associate with the viral genome to make the messenger RNA. And so how it's doing that association process, if you have just this RNA, or again, I wish they'd done the genomic um, RNA here as well. The genomic RNA, if it's got this hairpin at the end and you don't have VP30 around, the viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is never going to bind there. It's never going to make that messenger RNA, so you're never going to get the protein. You're never going to get replication of the virus. Yeah? Thank you. Does the hairpin loop also affect translation? So that's a great question. Does the hairpin loop also affect translation? And I've tried to find some data on that, and I haven't been able to yet. <laughs> so very good question. I think it should make sense, yeah. but I don't know if it does or not. Yeah, it's pretty sure. Yeah, so the question, um, Luke, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, eventually I'll learn like you know, four of your names and then the class will be done. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, so the question is, are, is VP30 packaged in the virion? And the answer is most definitely yes. Um, so it is packaged with the genome. So when the genome comes inside the cell, if it's packaged normally with this VP30, then you have transcription of all of these messenger RNAs um, that will be functional. So again, it has to come in because if it's not there, you're never going to get um, transcription, you're never going to get translation, you're never going to get that protein in the first place. So it has to be present in the very end. And this is also, again, Another theme, one more time, he says, like paramyxos and raptos. Uh, but basically, all of the virus genome encoded proteins are present in virions. Um, and this is, again, it's true for all of these negative strand RNA viruses. Almost all of those encoded proteins are present in virions. Okay, more questions about molecular stuff. Now, of course, there's another question because he's got clicker questions. So. Um, which of the following Ebola virus proteins is most likely to interact with the cellular receptor? Again, feel free to 
discuss here. And I'll let you read them. I'm not going to read it myself. Well, well, this particular one is just present at the uh, very extreme of 3' prime end of the genome and then 5' prime end of that messenger RNA. And so it's just there. But that's the NP protein. It's the first one you get to. And so it just seems to be regulating at that particular point. You can move it, and people have done that, and you see that you get the same kind of you basically get attenuation all the way to the rest of the rest of the genome. But yeah, the stem loop is really just present at the three prime end of the genome. Which of course the five prime end of the genome. <laughs> Ben. Oh, you guys are still trying to ruin my statistics, aren't you? <laughs> So the, uh, what you may or may not have guessed is that I made up this clicker question before I found that cell article <laughs> this morning showing that GP was interacting um, with the, what's the cellular receptor? Neiman pick C1. Horrible name. That's the problem is we find these things after um, we've already looked at, looked at the virus to start with. And they unfortunately already have names. So... <clears throat> Unfortunately, but it's Neiman Pick, so NP also. Right. Yeah. Well, I will try, try to say Neiman Pick rather than the NPC. It's like uh, NPCC one. Uh, yeah. Alphabet soup. And uh, you think virology is bad? Take immunology. It's even worse. Um, so, <laughs> and then of course you can then forget all those acronyms because they keep reusing them in different contexts. Horrible. So. Um, <clears throat> Has anybody been here? Do you know where this is? So it's in Galveston, Texas. Who knows what's in Galveston, Texas? All kinds of different. <laughs> not the Alamo. No. <laughs> University uh, lots of, of federal money for hurricane damage. <laughs> lots of federal money for hurricane damage, which is actually very interesting. We'll get back to hurricanes in just a second. Here. Uh, so at the point I think this picture was taken, um, this is one of the four BSL-4 labs in the U.S. So this is the Biosafety Level 4 lab at University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas, um, literally right in the path of hurricanes. Why would you want to build a BSL-4 lab right in the way of hurricanes? I thought this was a really crazy question, um, but I, in fact, met some of the architects who designed it. And they said, we actually much prefer to have somewhere near hurricanes because you see the hurricane coming, and um, you've got a pretty good idea what kinds of winds and waves, et cetera, you're going to have. Earthquakes, no prediction. Not sure what you're going to have. Tornadoes, no prediction, not sure what you're going to have. So there was, in fact, a hurricane. I forget which one it was. Um, Ivan, was that, I think? Um, that actually pretty much had a direct hit on Galveston. Um, flooded out basically everything that was there. My colleague who works on electron microscopy lost his microscope because it got yeah. flooded. Um, but they had, the BSL-4 lab was up and running until three days before the hurricane came in. They shut it down. Four days later, it was back up and running. Um, partly because the BSL-4 lab is actually all right here. You see these blacked out windows right here? Right behind that is the BSL-4 lab. Um, all these windows on the outside here um, go to a blank wall. Uh, <laughs> and the way that you build a BSL-4 lab is you basically build a lab inside a lab. It's a completely isolated building inside another building. Um, it's really pretty amazing, the, the architecture and everything else that goes into that. Yeah? Well, isn't it kind of like an oil refinery, though? You can't really turn it off. 
Oh, no, so you, well, you basically, what, so what you do, so the question is, so how do you turn off a BSL-4 lab? <laughs> um, basically, what you do is you take all of the select agents, the nasty stuff that you're working with, and put it into the, you know, special cryo containers, et cetera. You're no longer doing any active work um, at that point. And so, and then oh. once you get all of your ventilation yeah, and everything else, Right. Yeah. Well, and, and make sure that it's actually in basically a safe, <laughs> um, which will survive um, the hurricane. And in this case, um, survived perfectly well. And why do you have these kinds of labs? Um, a, that picture of the Ebola virus that I showed right at the beginning, that was actually taken in this building uh, right here. It was actually inactivated Ebola, so they could work with it in BSL-3 rather than BSL-4. Um, and I think this is the only place in the world where they have an electron microscope at BSL-3. Uh, and then uh, the other thing is that in, under these conditions, you can actually do these kinds of experiments, which are shown right here. We talked a little bit about this already when we talked about the coronaviruses. How do you look at RNA virus genomes and then reconstruct them, put them back together? Um, this process, again, depends on, you can't see it here, um, T7, RNA polymerase promoters, um, put together with some kind of cDNA, you transcribe all of these pieces, put them all together, and you can end up with a fully infectious um, Ebola virus genome. Yeah? So do researchers like rent time at the laboratory, or is it just a central team that's always doing new stuff? So the question is, um, basically, do researchers you know, try and you know, set up an experiment to work there, or do you work with a team that's already there? And the answer is actually some of both. Um, it depends on exactly what experiments you're doing. Uh, but there are specific groups here that they're real speciality. And you also have to get trained in the whole process of working at these um, high biosafety levels. And so that whole process of training takes lots of time and money. So if anything, um, you're better off getting someone else to do these particular projects. But the whole approval process takes literally years to do some of these experiments. Um, and then um, you're usually, you, when you write that protocol, you say, I'm going to work with this group that's already doing these kinds of things at somewhere like uh, UTMB um, looking at this. Um, one of the reasons, by the way, that UTMB has this BSL-4 facility is it was all of the tropical diseases, particularly from the Caribbean, that were coming through Galveston anyway because it was such an important port. And so people have been working with these uh, nasty tropical diseases there for for literally for decades and almost almost centuries now. Uh, <clears throat> some of you may wonder, well, okay, Ebola virus, Ebola, yeah, it's from actually a place in Central Africa. Why Marburg? Um, this is Marburg right here. Do you see very many castles in Germany? Oh, is that in, 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 yeah, in Germany. Yes, lots of castles in Germany. You see um, castles where you normally expect, uh, expect endemic um, phyloviruses to be. And so um, this is Mar actually a really beautiful, beautiful town, great university. They're doing some really cool work on archaeal biology. Uh, but Marburg virus was first found um, in the 1960s because people were working there with monkeys and then came down with this really nasty disease and eventually tracked back um, through, curiously enough, Belgrade, which is where the, the monkeys had come through. Um, but all of those monkeys were originally um, present in Africa. And again, naming of these particular virus diseases is just from where you had the first cases. And the first cases where these were actually really recognized um, was in Marburg. So it's um, confusing to think about Marburg virus. And we'll talk about another case um, a little bit later on here. Um, scientists were the ones who, well, were first noticed to get sick. And probably there were various outbreaks of disease where these monkeys originally came from, but no one had noticed it particularly at the time. Yeah, Luke? Well, that was my question, is where, did they identify where the monkeys came from in Africa? Yeah, yeah so um, mostly here, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Central Africa. And <clears throat> this, um, so here, the original um, Ebola outbreak um, was in, remember correctly, uh, here, in 76, um, this is that area, um, Ebola, which was originally found. Uh, 
Up to 2005, there are only about 500 cases <coughs> of Ebola total. Um, Marburg, um, again, Marburg fever, uh, probably originally came from areas like here in Kenya um, or in the now Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, Zaire depends on what political flavor you happen to have. But one of the things to notice here is that almost all of these are relatively small areas and almost all of them here in Central Africa. Most places also a long way away from the major population centers, which are mostly on the coasts um, of all of these places. One thing to note here down at the bottom, um, there was a case in Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, um, in 94, and then also Marburg outbreaks in 75. In fact, more recently, um, there were some Marburg outbreaks in Angola, so getting a little bit further afield. And then, you know, my favorite location for uh, filovirus outbreak, <laughs> rest in Virginia. <laughs> so, um, Rest in Virginia is the <clears throat> primate colony for the National Institutes of Health. So this is where uh, they keep all of their monkeys. And there were a few monkeys that got sick. They looked at these monkeys and said, hmm, that's weird. They've got this bizarre virus that's associated with, oh, phylovirus. Hmm, looks a lot like Ebola. Ah! Um, <laughs> It turns out that uh, this particular phylovirus is not pathogenic to humans, so it's an incredibly useful model system to work with in terms of looking at phylovirus disease. So um, Reston, Virginia, um, and so Reston Ebola virus um, is one of the particular strains of Ebola virus um, that are out there. And as I mentioned before, it's a big genome, right? About 19,000 bases. There are, of course, lots of changes that happen during replication of these genomes. So it's really easy to identify that this is the Reston Ebola viruses versus the Zaire Ebola viruses and all of the other Ebola viruses. And so this is how we know that it's really not an issue. And if there were massive Ebola virus disease outbreaks in the US, that were related to this Reston virus, then we could go back and look at that. That's not been the case. So why do we all care? Um, 30 to 90 percent fatality actually have gotten much better numbers since the last outbreak. Um, but the main issue here is the hemorrhagic fever, you know, bleeding out of all of your orifices. Turns out that that's actually a relatively small number of cases that is what happens with <clears throat> Ebola virus. But it does infect particularly immune system cells and particularly the macrophages. That's where Neiman Pick C1 is very highly overexpressed. Um, clearly, these viruses are not normally circulating in humans. If you've got a 30 to 90% fatality rate in humans, um, it's not going to be very <clears throat> productive in terms of the spread of your virus disease. And it turns out it's actually quite hard to catch. Um, any of these Ebola virus diseases, at least we thought so. Um, probably bats, and we'll see um, some of the examples of that a little bit later on at the end of lecture today. Uh, so zoonotic disease, again, um, coming from a non-human animal. Uh, why do people, how do you people get infected, I should say? Almost always this is close family or medical personnel which is um, really kind of sad because these are the people who are trying to treat the people um, who have these diseases. Um, and that probably is <clears throat> uh, sort of a you know, you know, reason why people get so upset and excited about it, um, but also as an indication it's really hard to catch these particular diseases. And you actually probably need very large numbers of virions in order to actually come down with the disease. Um, and part of the aspects of that, you remember these are really big, long particles, um, and they're enveloped viruses. Turns out that they're not really that stable out in the environment. So the shedding that happens of these viral diseases, um, I'd say the phyloviruses, uh, you get very high numbers in an infected patient, but the spread doesn't happen very rapidly. So it's quite unlike 
those paramixos and rhabdos, um, like measles, where one person in this room would infect everybody, or at least expose everybody. Um, um, if you're, I don't see anybody here who would be infecting anyone else with Ebola. None of you are getting too, too close and personal. Um, so that transmission process is a lot lower. Yeah? Um, hasn't there been some media cases recently where there's been some there's been some cases popping up intermittently because they think it's from sexual transmission. So, um, yeah, where where do you get some of these? Um, so there are sexual transmission, um, and we'll, a little bit with Zika. I don't want to get into too much detail on that. Um, there may be some sexual transmission, uh, but the amounts are very, very small and very, very small numbers that this is happening with. If there were more sexual transmission happening, we would see way more spread of disease. And that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, so if you look at something like HIV, which is clearly sexually transmitted, if you look at just the epidemiology, how that disease spreads, clearly something you have a lot more of. One thing you would expect, sexually transmitted, sex workers would come down with massive amounts of disease. That's not true for these filovirus diseases. So, and the few cases that are happening um, there are also, you know, usually there's going to be some other kind of intimate contact above and beyond the sexual process, and so where the viruses are coming from. Um, so there was one case in, I think it was Sierra Leone, um, where they um, thought that there was a sexual transmission taking place, but it was also actually not clear whether it was the <clears throat> person who was the recovering Ebola patient was the one who infected the partner, may have actually been the partner who was then reinfecting the other one. So there's some, there's some interesting issues about trying to deal with some of these cases here. Um, there's one case with Marburg, but again, these are single cases. And so it's probably a very, very rare effect when it does happen. Yeah? I could be wrong, but it, it seems like this like Ebola is more contagious than flu. Is that, is that wrong? Or why would that be? Oh, so... Ebola more are con uh, more contagious than rabies. Well, rabies is usually present in saliva, and uh, so it's the biting aspect which is really important in terms of. And so I think if, if people infected with Ebola were going around biting other people, that would probably <laughs> be an issue. Uh, but one of the real the big questions is how did you get this transmission yeah. from the zoonosis to the actual, you know, humans. And so there may actually have been some cases in saliva. And people have detected Ebola virus in saliva. People have detected Ebola virus in semen. So it's a possibility in terms of that transmission. Um, but in terms of the actual process, so it's really hard to say, you know, rabies vice versus because uh, the other thing is it doesn't seem to change behavior like rabies does. And so that's, a, that gets it's really hard to say which one of those would be more, um, Easy to trans transmit. Yeah, Luke. Um, just to follow up, so isn't there some cases though where people treat it for Ebola then have it in their eyes? I mean, is that a lysogenic, pure lysogenic state, or is that some sort of rotation? So because it's hiding out there in a privileged immune system. Right. So uh, this. Uh, so yeah, there are cases, and in fact, one of the say, eventually get to the West Africa outbreak. I promise. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but. Um, because there have been so many cases there, people have actually been able to follow up in terms of numbers. Because there were 3,000 cases until three years ago, um, actually known. Um, and so of those cases, um, there probably were cases where you had these immune privilege sites. Um, semen is one of those. Um, eyes are certainly other cases as well. Um, but transmission through those processes is a really interesting question. How much does that actually happen? And so it's probably actually relatively low amounts. You can certainly see them. We've gotten really good at detecting these things. And so if you detect them, they're there. OK, fine. But are they actually infectious through that process? But they're still replicating. The question is, are they still replicating there or not? Are they just persisting? And that's an interesting question that nobody has a really good um, handle on. Yeah, Patrick. I was just going to say, I don't want to say this could be Yeah, so, so it does seem that you actually need a quite large number of PFUs <laughs> so in order to get that transmission actually to take place. And so that's probably why. Uh, 
close family and medical personnel, these are people who are involved with patients when they're at peak viremia, i.e. the highest amounts of actual virions which are there. And I forget the numbers, but apparently in the blood of an infected patient, you can get you know, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 um, particles per mil. It's just huge. Yeah. Well, just to Well, so let's, let's not discuss this transmission stuff because you know, what's, what's worse, what's better, and that's, that's always going to be really hard and how you get those infection processes taking place is really hard. Sure. Um, this is actually a serious question, although yeah. it made him laugh. What about um, transmission of semen into eyes? That, sorry, this is a serious question. Oh, no, 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 it's, 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 it's a very serious question. Now, again, the, the question gets back really to the question about how how are you actually getting that infection in the first place? And where does that actually have to happen? So I don't know where Neiman's Fix C1 is, and I don't know where um, the, the amounts in semen that people have found have been very, very low. And so getting the infection through that, I think, is, a, is an interesting question. And I, I don't know where Neiman Fix C1 is. Presumably if there are you know, eye cells and you happen to be at, you know, because there certainly are some big issues with, you know, that's what you do when you're treating Ebola patients is covering eyes is really, really critical. So that's part of the process. So um, the other reason that people got really excited about Ebola um, was, of course, our friends, the media, um, talking about all of this stuff. So there's a great TWIV, one of the This Week in Virologies, um, No Restin' for the Weary. Um, they also called this, you know, This Week in Ebola Virology for a while, for about three months. That was all they were talking about. Um, so <clears throat> we knew about Ebola in 1967. In 2014, there had been 2,800 cases and about 2,000 deaths, and only about 50 known introductions into humans. And that's actually really quite interesting. And the reason we know that, again, is because you can track the sequences of these particular uh, viruses. And so there really haven't been too many of these zoonotic transmissions, um, again, since since 1967, the virions are not really good at heat, detergent, flight. Um, so you have to get a really rapid exposure to large numbers of virions to actually come down with this disease. Um, and then, um, anyone seen this film? Um, not actually a very good one. Contagion is way better. Um, but the media love these things. Um, so in 2012, um, there were... A few cases, and this is really pretty typical. Any given year, there will be, you know, on the order of 20 or 30 cases. So one fatal case in 2011, um, seven cases in December of 2012, um, 24 cases in July and October, 77 cases in the Congo. So, you know, relatively small numbers. Um, this is for Ebola, Marburg, same kind of thing. Um, there was one tourist died in 2008, so people get really excited about this. One U.S. tourist was fine, um, but because of all of these, you know, nastiness, and maybe because of the media as well, um, CDC formed this what they call the Special Pathogens Branch. And this sounds like a cool. I need like a you know, jacket or something. <laughs> special pathogens branch. Uh, but it's it's actually really nice. They, they talk about a lot of the diseases that they're working on at the CDC, which is one of the other places in the country where they have. Um, a BSL-4 facility. And I just put a bunch of links in here so you can find some of these things. Um, <clears throat> so I started getting more interested in this uh, on my lecture two years ago, 2nd of May, curiously enough, almost exactly this time of year. Um, in 2014, there were 200 cases in Liberia and Guinea and about 62% you know, fatality. A lot of healthcare workers uh, were coming down with disease at that point. This is how people from the CDC were working with these virus samples at the time. So, and this is in fact you know, directly from this PDF on you know, how you work with viral hemorrhagic fevers um, at that time. So clearly um, some changes have happened um, since then. 
Um, and again, this was literally two years ago, 200 cases. Yeah, it's uh, bigger than most of the other outbreaks, but wasn't such a big deal. Um, this is where they were, um, 14th of April, um, 14. Almost all of them here in this border region between Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. And hopefully you remember where most of our cases were before. They were all here in Central Africa. There was that one case in Cote d'Ivoire, but um, these are all here in extreme West Africa, which uh, was really the main issue, I think, with these diseases here. So here's that particular place, give you an idea what that looks like. These are the kinds of markets, in fact, that are in this part of the world. Um, <clears throat> this uh, area right here, Kisunduhu, uh, this is in fact the main marketplace in Kisunduhu, uh, where we had the very first aspects of this disease. In fact, probably the place that it originally came from is here. Um, a little hard to see this particular picture here. Um, but <clears throat> gives you an idea of the uh, populations, how people get around, um, motorbikes. This is the main road um, through Meliandu. Um, and the processes of here, as you probably can guess, of medical care here is not the same kind of standard that we'd expect in other places. Uh, and yeah. Is, for a lot of these cases, is there a Correlation with bushmeat consumption? So that was one of the thoughts was originally, again, big question. Where does this come from? Where's the zoonosis? How did it happen? Um, and <clears throat> bushmeat is one of the ideas. Probably not, because patient zero um, here in Meliandu um, was a, I think, three-year-old. Oh. Um, and involved with, you know, going out, playing with the bats, etc. So whether it was a bat guano, bat bite, um, anything like that is really not clear. But um, people have now gone back and looked at all of these and found that you know, almost definitely this is the place. But if you look around here, you'll notice that there's practically nothing around. And let's see if I found the, um, yeah, so Kisundugu, that was the big market. That's the big place. Um, and the market that I showed there, that's the, you know, top end high civilization relative to um, what we have here. Practically no medical facility. In fact, the only hospital was, um, is up here in, in Kisundugu. Nothing local here. Also, these borders right here are incredibly porous. Um, and lots of people just go back and forth across these borders. There's no kind of border control whatsoever between all of these. And again, given that it's an extremely rural area, um, communication is extremely difficult and getting things in there is, is a real problem. So <clears throat> this was the case, um, again, a couple of years ago. This is um, 2014, uh, here in June of 2014. Um, it looks as if what's happening here is we had these outbreak, and it actually seemed to be coming down. So there's this outbreak in Guinea. <coughs> Slowing down, not a big deal. Um, and then, of course, that was 2014. Um, there's this really nice New York Times article um, talking about how we screwed up. Um, and we being the CDC in the US, the WHO in Geneva and in Africa, basically, people thought it was over. They hoped it was over. And it wasn't. It was just hiding there. And so last year. This is where all the cases were. And the big problem here is that most of the cases had moved from this area right here out to places like here, which are the main population centers, where people are living much, much, much more closely together with each other. And spread can happen much, much more rapidly. So this is how treatment <clears throat> is going on, or was going on, I should say, um, last year. Um, full protective gear, one of the things that you can't see here, that this is the tropics. So it's 90 plus degrees Fahrenheit, 90 plus degrees, or 90 plus percent humidity, um, running around in these suits um, about for an hour 
or so. 90 minutes was the maximum that people were supposed to be um, using um, these particular um, treatments <coughs> centers from. Um, this is from last April. Um, numbers coming down, but still, particularly here in Guinea around Conquerie, which is the capital, the, the major center. Um, Liberia had gone um, way down here, but still, lots and lots of cases. What we had, <clears throat> just literally when I looked this up last night, um, 3rd of May, um, this was last year. Um, we had 26,000 cases. You remember up till 2013, we had about 3,000 cases. Um, so 10 times as many just in this outbreak. The other thing is that it wasn't just um, May of 2015 to May of 2016. Um, there have been about 2,000, a little over 2,000 more cases, uh, almost 1,000 more deaths, literally in that last year. We thought Ebola was over, right? Well, over in most places, but still some of this. So uh, West Africa was a huge issue, and in fact, the latest cases of these, um, I think the last case, um, I believe it was Sierra Leone, was declared Ebola-free in March of this year. Uh, on the other hand, we had Ebola in the U.S. <gasps> Eek! How many cases? Four. Actually, cases of um, Ebola here. Uh, one was imported um, directly and then caused two other people to get sick. Um, another one, and this is the guy, in fact, who has, still has some Ebola particles in his eyes. Um, this is a doctor who came back and, and brought it with him as well. Um, one death in the United States. So um, what do people think about this? <laughs> 51 million people were concerned that they or their family will contract Ebola. 20%? Yeah. This is absolutely ridiculous. Um, so this was admittedly uh, in low average intelligence. Yeah, 2014. We won't say anything about what presidential candidate these people might be voting for. Um, but, and this is actually not completely true because you know since then there were a couple of people who in fact had um, contracted Ebola and two in the actual U.S. So um, uh, be careful about you know, some of these things and, and what public opinion actually is. I remember, in fact, going to um, visit my GP and it's like, have you been in West Africa? You have to report on this. So I teach, I literally just got out of my Ebola lecture. <laughs> this is not something that we need to be worried about. So <clears throat> that being said, all of you, of course, are very well informed. So you can answer this one um, quite nicely. So, in which country were the most Ebola deaths ever reported? Guinea, the Liberia, Sierra Leone, USA, or Zaire? Salute, <laughs> <laughs> Alex. I, I, I did think about that, actually, when I was putting this question together. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. There was some. Uh, we could talk about those things for a while. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> Should be free, feel free to share. Number here? 4810, uh, Liberia. In the bats, toasting them on sticks and eating them. Okay. 
Okay, so <clears throat> what should you look for when you're looking for Ebola? Um, unexplained bleeding, actually relatively rare. Fever, headache, fatigue. I have those all the time. Um, and uh, diarrhea and vomiting, yeah, stomach pain, muscle pain. These are actually not unusual in terms of disease. So when somebody comes into the clinic and says they're really sick, how do you actually know if they have Ebola? And this is one of the big problems that people had when people came in to some of these clinics is how do you know? You just have to assume that they have some of these things if you're not in the US. Um, top 10 things you need to know about Ebola. Your dog or cat is not spreading Ebola. Food and drinks imported in the US are safe to drink. Mosquitoes are the deadliest animals in the world, but they do not carry Ebola. Um, your family members, coworkers, and neighbors returning from countries that Ebola outbreak do not pose a danger to you and your family. Um, household bleach and other disinfectants do kill Ebola. In fact, lots of things do. Uh, feeling sick, think it's flu, not Ebola. That's what we'll be talking about on Friday. Uh, remember also, number of cases of Ebola ever, about 40,000 ever. We'll get back to that later on. Ebola is not airborne, so you don't have to worry about it unless you're really, really close to the person next to you, and I don't see any of you doing that. Um, Ebola outbreak is not affecting air travel. One person or another, um, one symptom start, and no, you can't get Ebola from a handshake or a hug. Uh, possible treatments, just finish up talking some of these vaccines here. There are a few vaccines that are being developed. Um, and whether they work post-exposure is a really interesting question. I think some of the best vaccines right now are the artificially made ones, so recombinant vectors. Um, and then people use RNAi to treat Marburg disease, uh, but not so much for Ebola. I'm going to finish up with the vaccine stuff, and then we'll get back to that. Uh, just really quickly, this RSV Zibov, um, this is what I talked about last time as using the vesicular somatitis virus. Um, turns out in this case, they deleted the G protein and put in the GP30 protein. And so literally swapping out that glycoprotein seems to work pretty well. Um, this is talking about that particular clinical trial. Um, the next vaccine, and I'll get to your question in a second, um, is the... Delta VP30, so you remember that's the VP30 protein, which is the one that's really important for transcriptional regulation. You knock it out, you get really good protection in non-human primates. Um, it hasn't actually been used in humans yet, because how do you protect them against Ebola virus disease when it's not really circulating that much anymore? So um, I'll, at that point, um, answer your question. Sorry. Oh, I was wondering, is what makes the virus um, airborne is the viral size. Oh, so what makes the virus airborne? And so what allows it to be transmitted um, aerosol processes? It's a whole combination of different things. So it has to do with the exact structure of the membrane and the glycoproteins that are on the outside. Um, so size is part of it, but it's only part of the process. So um, this is how we think Ebola virus is spread, probably mostly in the bats, um, and then some point, somehow, big question here is how you get this transmission from zoonosis um, over to humans. And this is the job that I don't want to have, um, <laughs> analyzing bats in Uganda here for each of these people has a bat that they're analyzing right here. Um, you will also notice, however, that they do have um, respirators and extra airflow here. But uh, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs>